هتبتدي شير السلايدز بتاعتك هتحطنا على اول سلايد. جود ايفنينج اور دير فيورز اند اودينس فروم اول اوفر ذا وورلد. توداي از ون اوف ذا فيرست داي كلينيكال نايتس ات سي اي سي. We will be discussing uh, a very important and interesting uh, topic today, uh, the topic of uh, myocarditis uh, uh, from the clinical, uh, pathophysiological, immunological, and etiological point of views. I'm very glad and honored today of cardiology from Cairo University. I'm honored to have I'm moderating this session today with a very elegant uh, speaker, uh, my dear friend, uh, cardiology. So this is a very short uh, introduction, and I will pass uh, the mic now uh, to my dear friend, uh, Dr. Ahmed Shahata, to start sharing the slides. While he's doing this, we will enjoy the moderation by Dr. Hussein Hishmat and the interesting comments from Dr. Karim Saeed and all of our elegant board. So please uh, start, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, we will discuss uh, tonight uh, a very important issue, especially in these days, which is myocarditis. Myocarditis, in its broadest sense or common sense, myocarditis means the presence of inflammatory cells inside the myocardium, which can occur due to any injury of the myocardium. This injury could be ischemia, or it could be trauma, or it could be even of genetic etiology. However, this injury will culminate into a common final pathway, which is the presence of inflammatory cells. We can classify the injury of the myocardium into either discrete external antigen, like virus or drugs or toxins or others, or due to internal trigger, due to autoimmune reaction against self antigen. At the end, myocardial inflammation should be proven then the cl clinical scenario is telling to be linked together to diagnose myocarditis. Definition of myocarditis, the WHO law and International Society and Federation of Cardiology have defined myocarditis in 1996 as inflammatory cardiomyopathy, cardiac inflammation associated with cardiac dysfunction. Dallas criteria in 1995 defined myocarditis as the presence of mononuclear cellular infiltration accompanied by myocyte damage, which may be degeneration or necrosis or both, with or without fibrosis, in the absence of the typical damage caused by coronary artery disease. However, Dallas criteria faced many limitations, uh, like uh, it lacked uh, uh, good reproducibility with great inter-observer variability. In addition, the sensitivity of the Dallas criteria is low, even beyond the sampling technique, which is the endomyocardial biopsy, inherent due to hematoxin and eosin staining of the myocardial tissue in the histology, its sensitivity is low. This led to improvement of this by introduction of immunos, uh, immunophenotyping of the cell and immunohistochemical staining, which led to introduction of Marburg criteria in 1996 and defined the cardiomyopathy as a presence and filtration of at least 14 lymphocytes, predominantly T lymphocytes, of them maximum four macrophages is included. The incidence and the prevalence of myocarditis is largely underestimated, and its precise assessment is very difficult. This is because of many things. Over one of them, a majority of the patients are asymptomatic, uh, the endomyocardial biopsy is infrequently performed out of referral medical center. Even if the endomyocardial biopsy is done, it faces many limitations. As I said before, endomyocardial biopsy is uh, the patchy nature of the myocarditis. You may lose or to clinch the diagnosis. In addition, the lack of evidence-based medicine leading to underperforming of the endomyocardial biopsy. In addition, the different heterogeneity of the clinical presentation of myocarditis led to underestimation of the incidence and the prevalence. However, the incidence and the prevalence of viral myocarditis have to evolve over the past few years. This is mainly due to introduction into the newer bio microbiologic uh, molecular biology, into the diagnosis, namely PCR, and the insight to hybridization, leading to increased number of diagnosed myocarditis annually. 
as I remember the figure in 19 and, and 2013, the number of myocarditis about 1.5 million. It increased to about 2.5 million in, 19, in uh, 2015. If you wanted to have a figure, the burden of myocarditis as a percentage of prevalent heart failure, it revenge by the age and the region, and the region from approximately 0.5 to 4%. And this is a great difference in the, in, the, in the figures due to different criteria for diagnosis. Do we diagnose myocarditis by clinical and lab only, or we will include into myocardial biopsy? As a cause of sudden cardiac death, it comes the third cause after uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the congenital and atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. There is a slight male predominance, maybe due to sex hormones, and the incidence according to the age is bimodal. The risk is highest in the first year of life, then it declines from the second year of life till puberty, then rise again to about the age of 40. In one series, the median age of my lymphocytic myocarditis is about 42 years old. There is many, many causes of acquired myocarditis. It may be infectious, may be due to viral, the most common. Viral myocarditis, the most common is enterovirus, adenovirus, parvovirus P19, human herpes virus 6. Bacteria may cause myocarditis, protozoal, uh, helminthes, uh, like Chagas disease, we will discuss in detail, or non infectious causes like toxins like chemotherapy or autoimmune-mediated systemic lupus erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis. It's a really big list of uh, causes. We will start with viral infection. We will discuss parvovirus B19. It uh, received a very considerable attention during the last couple of decades. Um, in 1950 to the most common viral myocarditis was due to Coxsackie virus or ecovirus. Then it changed in the last couple of decades to parvovirus P19. This virus is spread by respiratory route. Some information about the virus nature, it is non-enveloped and non-lytic virus, and it is a single-stranded DNA virus. Uh, it's a primary receptor is group B antigen. This is the antigen that internalizes the virus inside the cells to replicate. This antigen can be found on the erythrogenic megakaryocyte also present uh, present on the endothelial cells endothelial cells and uh, we can say that this virus is erythrotropic virus and endotheliotropic virus this virus is the prevalence of the parvovirus b19 in the general population is quite high and let me tell you the figures in children up to 15 years, the incidence about 50% of the children. And in older individuals, the presence of immunoglobulin G against parvovirus P19 detected up to 80% of this population. And this raised the question about the pathogenic role of the virus. Is the mere presence of virus is hazardous or not? Then we come to an important issue. The pathogenic role is related to either the viral load, which can be uh, which can be quantified by the copy number of uh, the viral uh, of the viral DNA, or the evidence of active viral uh, replication by detection of viral RNA replicative intermediate. Uh, astonishing enough, this virus in endotheliotropic and not found in the myocardial cell. It may be a bystander role in the pathogenesis of myocarditis. Enterovirus, including Coxsackie virus, is a member of the enterovirus by Chronoviridae family. It is a non-enveloped lytic virus, a single-stranded RNA genome. It shares a common virus with its uh, adenovirus. It internalized to the cell through CAR receptor, Coxsackie adenovirus receptors. As I said before, from 1950 to 1980, the enterovirus infection was the commonest viral infection, but its incidence in Western Europe decreased in this last couple of decades. This may due to prolonged exposure of the virus leading to herd immunity, or it can be confounded by seasonal outbreak of enterovirus infection. Coxsackie virus uh, uh, myocarditis, one of the most studied viral myocarditis uh, in the literature. Uh, this is because of long, long history of exposure. 
Kukseki virus meet the criteria of Koch's postulate. Koch was a German physician in the 19th century, and he had a postulation for the causal relation of any infectious agent. For any infectious agent to be a causal, it should satisfy four criteria. These four criteria, first, should be found regularly inside the lesion, which is متحققة في الأوكساكي إيكو فيروس. Number two, it can be isolated in a pure culture. Number three, it when it inoculated inside a host like mice, it recapitulate the disease. And finally, when uh, we can isolate it from this host. Oxaki virus meet all of these criteria. Other explanation for the extensive knowledge about Oxaki virus, it shares similarity to common virus like poliovirus or rhinovirus, which are very common. They share with them the viral replication cycle. Bacterial infection. Bacterial, virtually any bacterial agent can cause myocardial dysfunction due to sepsis. Metastatic infection of the myocardium usually involve the endocardium as we diagnose infective endocarditis. However, there is some bacteria that have a specific affection of the heart, like Corrine bacterium infection. Corrine bacterium diphtheria have markedly reduced in this era due to large mass vaccination. However, it, we may face very few cases. The injurious effect is mainly due to the exfoxin of diphtheria that directly damage the myocardium and the conductive system. Tropical infection, the famous uh, etiology of the acute rheumatic fever, which is a pancarditis. Lyme carditis, which is a rare disease, mainly seen in the west of uh, Europe. It is a thick born spirochete found in summer uh, days, followed, uh, characterized by the erythema chronica migraine, followed by a few weeks by acute neurologic joint or cardiac involvement. What we want to know about Lyme carditis, it affects the conductive system. It causes atrioventricular flock of variable degree. However, it is usually transient and does not necessitate permanent pain. Protozoa. Protozoa Chagas disease is a major cause of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy worldwide. It was first described by Carlos Chagas, the Brazilian physician, who was single-handedly discovered this flagellum protozoan the awal al qarn al 19 who can lihi al fadl in huwa to describe the complex life cycle of this flagellum protozoan um, from this diagram we i will talk for a few minutes about the life cycle which is like a little bit complex uh, the carrier of the disease is the vertebrate like uh, armadillo or the domestic cat they can be infected by this trypanosoma. Then when the vector, which is uh, uh, with a triatomin insect, uh, like uh, Rudivid bug, it can feed on the blood of these vertebrates. When it feeds on this blood, it internalizes and it got the epimastiogate. Epimastiogate, it changes into tripomastiogate. Then it enters the skin or the mucous membrane after itching of the, of the, of the human being when it will be infected. Tripamastiogate will enter the cell, the skeletal muscle, the neuron, the cardiac muscle. Then it, when it enters the cell, it infects the cell and it changes into amastiogate that will replicate in a very large number to the extent that it may cause amastiogate nest inside the skeletal muscle or the myocardium. Then the amastiogate can uh, transform into tripamastiogate that circulate in the blood, causing a parasitemia or infect other tissues. Uh, the clinical history and the clinical picture of Chagas disease is astonishing and strange. The symptoms typically begin one to two weeks after a bite or after a long period of transfusion of infected blood. The acute phase lasts for one or two months. Most of the patients are asymptomatic or develop the mild, mild constitutional symptoms. Possible manifestation, adenopathy, hepatomegaly, rarely myocarditis or meningoencephalitis. Cardiovascular abnormality like non specific ECG, first degree heart block may be seen. Treatment at this stage can cure the patient. What is the fate of the disease? Following the acute stage, up to 90% of the patient, the symptom resolves completely. Of these, 60 to 70 never, drop, never uh, develop chronic Chagas disease. 
However, they remain zero positive. With zero positive, they're very important. I will talk about it later in the presentation. 30 to 40% of the patient develop typical manifestation of the chronic form of Chagas disease. Chagas disease leads special predilection to two common organs, the heart and the GIT. In the heart, it causes fibrosis that culminate down into thinning, the aneurysmal formation and thrombus formation inside the ventricle. Is usually affected the right ventricle more than the left ventricle, and it affected the conductive system. The most common is right bundle branch block and left anterior hemiblock. In the GIT, it affected the plexus inside the GIT, leading to mega colon and the mega esophagus. 50 to 90 percent of patients with chronic Chagas disease of the of the we described remain asymptomatic despite this ongoing pathological changes. What are the treatment? The treatment, the goal of treatment in all form of Chagas disease to eradicate the parasite and drug is indicated for all patients. The only contraindication is the presence of advanced heart failure because of Chagas disease. Otherwise, should be given to the children, to the older patients, especially two groups of patients. Patients who acquired HIV infection and not previously treated, and the patient considered for organ transplantation to avoid infestation of the new graft. Then we will uh, talk about the immunology, uh, what the, the response of the immune system after viral myocarditis. When the virus enters the myocardial cell, we talked about it binds to the receptor internalized inside the cell, then it undergo viral replication using the nucleic acid of the myocyte, leading to formation of capsid protein and the DNA material or the RNA material of the virus. Then it is cleaved by uh, viral pro, uh, proteolytic enzymes into into small uh, nucleic acid materials that uh, encapsulated inside the capsid protein to replicate. What's the response of the immune system? innate immunity will acquire the immunity. Innate immunity is the early immunity. It's in the first four to five days after exposure to viral infection. And then innate immunity, Black and Syria. The innate immunity is a natural killer cell, and it is a macrophage. The natural killer cells attack the virus mainly by the secretions of interferon. Interferon are two types type 1 interferon, interferon alpha, and interferon beta, and type 2 interferon, interferon gamma. Aiding the innate immunity in this early stage is the T helper 1 cell of the T lymphocyte uh, family and the M1 macrophage and the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell as a part of the innate immunity has a very important role. It can, or it can, uh, it can identify the virus by the specific sequence in it that is known as pathogenic associated molecular pattern. It takes it by the TOR receptor and through second messenger or adapter protein like myd 8 or IREX, it sequences the number of signals that lead to production of cytokines and inflammatory mediators that aid in the inhibition of viral replication. This is the innate immunity that works in the first four to five days of infection. Later on, the T lymphocytes become in action. How it become in action? The dendritic cell takes the antigenic material of the virus and express it on the surface, as I said, the toll receptor in conjunction with type one and type two major histocompatibility complex. Then the T lymphocyte recognizes this antigenic sequence and they begin a series of differentiation into two types of cells. Type one or type of cell is the effector cell. Effector cells here the elbitagem virus would attack it with stimulate programmed cell death, necrosis or apoptosis. With that, not just the viral infected cell, but also the normal tissue. The effector cell is made T helper one, T helper two, and T helper seventeen. And the inhibitory cell or the protective cell was the cell that regulates the immune response and suppress the immune response is the T regulatory cell, which have an important role. This work in the lay after five days of infection. Then what is the fate of this, of this immune system? Either the immune system calm down and modulate it down and everything keeping calm and the viral replication is ended and the cure or either it will linger on, leading to development of cardiomyopathy. Very important thing to tell 
is that uh, new all the immune cells have an astonishing property, which is the plasticity. The macrophages is two types. The same macrophage, according to the milieu of the cytokines and the chemokine, may be M1 macrophage that work early with the innate immunity, and it stimulates the dendritic cells that inhibit the effector cell. This is an anti-inflammatory cell. M2 macrophage that is developed later in the, in the battle of infection, and it is anti-inflammatory, and it leads to growth. It leads to hypertrophy and fibrosis. Also, the T effector cell, T helper cell, and the T regulatory cell also show plasticity. The body may change between them according to the situation. As I said, the result of the battle is either the regulatory element restore the tolerance and the immune system get down and the virus is cleared, then the patient is cured. Or the effector immune cell takes the upper hand and the response become overwhelming leading to chronic inflammatory response, ongoing fibrosis, ongoing hypertrophy, leading at the end, and the most common phenotype is dilated cardiomyopathy. However, restrictive cardiomyopathy may develop, but in a small proportion of patients. What about the epigenetics in this subject? The epigenetic is very important. There is a small RNA molecules, which is a molecule about 20 nucleotide sequence. They are non-coding molecules. These molecules of RNA can bind to the three dash or the five dash untranslated region, or it binds to the to the coding gene itself. When it combines to the coding gene itself, it modulates the expression and the transcription of different protein, which usually cluster in single pathway, which may be inflammation or fibrosis. This micro RNA is very important, and they are a very large family. Some of them are defensive, like microRNA 221 or 222. This microRNA inhibits the viral replication, and so it inhibits inflammation. And others, like microRNA 21 and etc., these are inflammatory. What is here important, all of these microRNA are targets for new therapy in the future, promoting the microRNA, the defensive microRNA, and inhibiting the destructive microRNA. MicroRNA, as, a, as we said before, some of them defensive, some of them hazardous. The function of the immune system to orchestrate between them and to end the battle with viral clearance and without overwhelming response. These microRNA are a very good tool now and fertile tool for myocarditis diagnosis and the prognosis. Astonishing enough, they are elevated not according to inflammation, but according to the myocardial damage. The presentation of viral myocarditis varies widely. Most of, most of the patients are asymptomatic. The patient may present with chest pain syndrome, which may mimic much acute myocardial infarction, and we call the infarct-like picture, heart failure, arrhythmia, or even hemodynamic collapse. During outbreaks of influenza virus, they recognize transient electrocardiographic or echo, electrocardiographic or echocardiographic abnormality without any clinical presentation. Uh, as we said, the, the myocarditis, the age of myocarditis is bimodal, as I said. In the young children, the presentation is usually acute or permanent. This is because the immune system exposed to the antigen for the first time and its response is cuprant leading to exaggerated response. However, in the elderly group, the symptoms are more subtle. This is because of the tolerance of the immune system and the development of chronic inflammation or autoimmune reaction. The virus may change the, the clinical picture. Uh, barbovirus P19 is endotheliotropic virus common to cause endothelial dysfunction and usually present by chest pain syndrome. Giant cell myocarditis, which the etiology is query, leading to ventricular arrhythmia and heart block on presentation. Physical presentation, when we examine the heart, we may find picture of heart failure, like we uh, chamber enlargement, S3 gallop, elevated jugular venous pressure, lower limb edema, and the systemic examination may show clues toward the diagnosis of a specific etiology, like the presence of enlarged lymph nodes with hilar adenopathy and chest X-ray, such as the sarcoidosis. The presence of periuretic maculopapular rest, especially with an offending agent like drug is added recently, usually within two months 
and the presence of peripheral eosinophils suggest hypersensitivity reaction and eosinophilic myocarditis. Sustained or symptomatic ventricular tachycardia or high-grade AV block speaks of general uh, giant cell myocarditis or cardiac sarcoidosis. Laboratory evaluation. CBC, we, looks, uh, we look at uh, the total leukocytic count with predominantly lymphocytosis. ESR and CRB usually elevated. However, all of these are non-specific. They speak of inflammation. Serum viral antibody test. It is indicated, of course, it is really indicated in cases of myocarditis. This is because of two issues. Number one, they rise about fourfold during the acute stage and decline then in the convalescent. And in myocarditis, the period of the prodroma that precedes the myocarditis is over. Then when, when you will do the serum viral antibody test, you may find it normal. Second, astonishing that the, the studies that show the viral genome tend to correlate the serum viral antibody test with the virus that is detected inside the endomyocardial virus. Anti-cardiac antibody test, low specificity. Rheumatologic screening, anti-nuclear antibody or rheumatoid factor are often needed. However, a special form for scleroderma or polymyositis or Wagner glomerulonephritis rheumatosis this is not done routinely. It is done upon clinical suspicion only. Cardiac enzymes. This is, as we said before, from the pathophysiology. Myocarditis means the myocardial injury. Myocardial injury means the myocardial damage. And it is, by common sense, uh, cardiac enzymes should be elevated. High sensitive troponin can be found on up to 50% of cases. Troponin also have a prognostic value in patients with myocarditis. It correlates with severity of infection. It correlates with the ejection fraction. In children, the viral infection is very prevalent. Is it recommended to do routine virology for this patient, to do routine cardiac enzyme for patients with that children's viral infection? The answer is no. ACG is non-specific again. Now, nothing is specific in myocarditis except for uh, biopsy and the histological examination. ECG non-specific, however, give clues Sinus tachycardia may be present, atrial premature, ventricular premature beat, ventricular tachycardia, which is resistant to the treatment, speaks of sarcoidosis and cell myocarditis. Right bundle branch block is more, con uh, more common in Chagas disease. In addition to its diagnostic capability, it has a prognostic capability. The width of the QRS complex and the presence of the Q waves suggest poor prognosis. Echocardiography. How non-specific, it has no specific feature for myocarditis. However, it is the standard the procedure for evaluation of myocarditis, and I have a very important diagnostic and the prognostic role. It assesses the left ventricular function by calculating the ejection fraction, which is essential to establish a myocardial damage and to have to have a baseline data to monitor the response of the therapy and to give guidance to instruction regarding exercise and the return to work in patients with myocarditis. Fulminant myocarditis, this is, uh, we will uh, come to this uh, later on in the presentation, is an acute, uh, is acute onset, severe form of myocarditis, no time for the cardiac chamber to dilate, but there is edema of the myocardial wall that leading to thickening of the ventricle. Wall motion abnormality are often present. Usually, it does not follow vascular territory. However, its full vascular territory may be rarely, may be rarely seen. Wall motion and ST segment elevation and chest pains, then you go for coronary angiopathy to normal, go for CMR, in which show patchy distribution of mid wall to sub epicardial lesion. Pericardial effusion usually supports the diagnosis and signify myopericarditis. Right ventricular function is very important to prognostic factor. However, it is this piece of information is known from a small study. CMR, this is a very important diagnostic and the prognostic tool. It can show many of the pathogenesis of myocarditis. It can detect myocardial edema, it can detect myocardial injury, and there is a supporting criteria for diagnosis. Myocardial edema, as we all know, can be detected by increased in signal intensity and relaxation time of T2 weighted imaging. Regarding the hyperemia and the scar can be detected using T1 sequence. Early gadolinium enhancement can detect hyperemia. Late GAD enhancement detects myocardial damage or myocardial loss due to either degeneration, necrosis, or scar tissue. 
In the original like Lewis criteria, you have to diagnose by any two out of three. In the updated one, you have to diagnose myocarditis with two out of two. They give weight to T2 uh, mapping and assessment of myocardial edema it is more precise and assessment of extracellular volume by mapping. Also. Uh, here we can see in, the, in this picture, the first two picture, we can see to the right the T2 weighted images and we see the myocardial edema. To the left of it is the T2 mapping, which accurately assess and quantify the amount of edema and decrease the noise that is seen with the standard T2 weighted images. Non-ischemic damage can be seen by late gadolinium enhancement or assessment of extracellular volume. Supporting the criteria is the pericarditis, usually it's myopericarditis or depression of the left ventricular systolic function. Here is the PET scan, which is the gold standard for diagnosis of cardiac cyclodosis. In this PET scan, we have also, uh, always two roles, the rubidium-based images and the fluorid glucose images. The rubidium uh, images, it looks for the vascular perfusion or fusion, and FDG, it looks for the metabolism. In the last two rows of picture, we can see the very dense uptake of fluorid glucose in the mid to basal segment of the septum. And corresponding to these, there is decreased perfusion. Uh, these two rows, we can see the intense uptake of chlorodexyglucose in these images, and here the perfusion is defected in the anteroseptal part of the, anteroseptal part of the septum. In the lower image, this is the hybrid pet CT. It shows again increased the uptake of chlorodexyglucose. The other myocardial cell does not take because it depends on the free fatty acid for its metabolism. Endomyocardial biopsy. Endomyocardial biopsy is not a routine can to be done as a routine for diagnosis of myocarditis. Its use is mainly limited if a specific etiology is suspected, like giant cell myocarditis, like patients with isonophilic myocarditis, like patients with sarcoidosis. The broad use is limited. Why? Because of the cost, the availability of experience at center, the lack of evidence-based medical treatment, greater inter-observer variability, and the sensitivity of the endomyocardial biopsy to diagnose myocarditis is low even beyond the sampling technique. To increase the yield, some of the operators take sample from the left ventricle and right ventricle, and this does not increase the risk of complication, and take at least four to three to four samples to diagnose myocarditis. To know how, how the sensitivity is low, I will tell you a figure. If you take 17, 17 biopsy from the heart to diagnose myocarditis, the sensitivity will be only 80%. Uh, to improve the sensitivity of the endomyocardial biopsy, immunohistochemical staining is to visualize specific inflammatory cell, as I said in the previous study, to identify viral genome improves the sensitivity to a great extent. Identification of the viral genome is questioned, and as I said before, the mere presence of the virus does not mean the presence of myocarditis. It is about the function of the virus, about the viral load, and about the replicative intermediate. What's the indication of endomyocardial burst in the guidelines in patients with rapidly progressive heart failure despite conventional therapy or new onset ventricular arrhythmia or high grade AV block? Suspected the specific causes of myocarditis like giant cell myocarditis, immunophilic myocarditis, or cardiac sarcoidosis. من اللي احنا اتكلمنا عنه الدايجنوزس اوف مايوكارديتس مر بمراحل طويله مر بكلينيكال في الكلينيكال داتا ذن لابوراتوري ورك اب تو ايدنتيفاي مايوكارديال دامج اند فاينالي ذا هيستولوجي تو استابلش ذا بريزنس اوف انفلاماتوري سيلز انسايد ذا مايوكارد اف ا هيستولوجي از افيلبل اند اتس بوزيتيف ات از ا ديفينيت كيس اوف مايوكارديتس اف نوت وي ار بيتوين بوسيبل اكيوت مايوكارديتس اور بوسيبل سب كلينيكال اكيوت مايوكارديتس Both share increased, increased marker for myocardial image, for myocardial injury. Uh, the difference, if the symptoms are present, suggestive, it is a probable cause. If not present, it is a possible subclinical etiology. 
to break the, uh, the monotony, we will take a question. 20 year old woman is brought to the hospital because of extreme fatigue and exertional dyspnea over the past few months. Past medical history unremarkable except for upper respiratory tract infection one month earlier. There is no family history of cardiac illness. Examination revealed the hypotension, tachycardia, elevated jugular venous pressure, chest examination, bilateral rods, and cardiac examination, S3 gallop. Echo revealed dilated pulse ventricle with severe impairment of contractility. Which of the following statements is false? Well, the most likely etiology of this patient disorder is viral. Endomyocardial biopsy will not likely reveal a specific cause. Steroid will slow the progression of the disease. Acute and the convalescent serologic tests are generally unhelpful, while myocardial marker may occur in absent coronary artery disease. Uh, I guess you refer myocardial biomarker or biomarker elevation. احنا هناخدهم واحد واحد. Most likely etiology of this patient is viral لأن هو في viral illness موجود وبعديها بفترة قصيرة developed the frank heart failure. فدي نقدر نقول عليها زي السلايد اللي فاتت دي possible أكي possible acute myocarditis. Endomyocardial biopsy will not likely reveal a specific cause. This is a true. احنا عارفين endomyocardial biopsy sensitivity بتاعتها قليلة وكمان الحاجات الكتير اللي تكلمنا عنها. Uh, steroid will slow the progression of illness. I think it's a deal for the end. Most of the trials can it neutral. And some can be the steroids is the myocarditis treatment trial. Can it no effect uh, randomized the patient to steroid plus as a cyprine or cyclosporine versus placebo? There was no effect. Acute anticonvalescent serologic tests generally unhelpful. Yes, as we said before, because of the time delay. And because there is no association between the viral antibody tetra and the viral genome found in the biopsy, my biomarker definitely elevated in the presence of coronary artery disease myocarditis is myocardial damage. Uh, the specific clinical presentation of myocarditis, it may be acute, and this is the common uh, this is the common presentation. Constitutional symptom may be upper respiratory tract infection, followed by cardiac symptoms, they may on. ممكن يجي بهارت فيلير سيمتومز ممكن يجي بتشست تشست بين سندروم وممكن يجي كمان باريزميا فاريس تايبس اوف اريزميا سوبرا فينتريكولار اند فينتريكولار اريزميا كرونيك اكتيف مايوكارديتس ودي الماجوريتي اوف ذا بيشنت هو ديفلوب ذا دايليتد كارديو مايوباثي هنا الانسيت بيكون انسيديوس زي ما قلنا غالبا في الاول ذا اذرز لان الايميون سيستم التوليرنس بتاعه بيبقى هاير وبالتالي ما بيحصلش اكيوت ولا اكسيتيوبرند Response to the offending agent, but the immune system be lingers on, leading to cardiomyopathy. Symptoms if a moderate cardiac dysfunction or moderate uh, cardiac dysfunction, or hatta fil biopsy be like borderline myocarditis. Fulminant myocarditis. Ten percent of the patients with biopsy proven myocarditis display this issue. So fulminant myocarditis. This disease characterized by hemodynamic collapse and rapidly progressive heart failure. Walakin. The fulminant myocarditis the response or the prognosis is very good if the patient received the good support. Good support that can get to a mechanical circulatory assist device. Now, most of the patients of fulminant myocarditis they recover over a period of weeks or more. Giant cell myocarditis it has a subtle onset. Subtle onset, like no chronic myocarditis. But after the subtle onset, they can get a heart failure or arrhythmia. namely ventricular tachycardia or high-grade AV block that fail to respond to the standard medical treatment. Here, unlike fulminant myocarditis, the survival is very poor, less than six months. And here, this is the indication for high dose, multi-agent immune suppression for a sufficient period. If we stop the immune suppression prematurely, the patient may relapse. Immune suppression together with hemodynamic support using mechanical circulatory assist device may improve the prognosis. Last to hope is cardiac transplantation. Okay, Dr. Ahmed, allow me no. just for uh, uh, a small, uh, a few questions because we're getting uh, some questions from the viewers on YouTube. No. Uh, Mustafa, she has sent uh, three questions. Uh, I'll try to, uh, to take them in terms of uh, definition. in terms of uh, immune factors, in terms of uh, imaging. 
Uh, and of course, the issue of myocarditis now is very hot because of uh, the blessed COVID-19, which is uh, ruining our lives. So yeah. now we realize that myocarditis is, is, really, uh, is really there and uh, it's not uncommon. Uh, yeah. The next question was, uh, based on the European and other definitions, it's uh, mostly a pathological diagnosis. طبعا طبعا هو المايوكارديتيس زي ما اتفقنا عشان يبقى ديفينيت مايوكارديتيس لازم يبقى فيه هيستولوجيك ايفيدنس احمد احمد سوري كان كان مي سبيك ان انجلش بليز بيكوز وي هاف سام فيلوس فروم اوتسايد ايجيبت ديفينيتلي مايوكارديتيس مايوكارديتيس از وي سيد بيفور از ا دايجنوزيس باي هيستولوجي واف وي دايجنوز مايوكارديتيس ان ا ديفينيت واي يو شود هاف ا بايوبس And the biopsy reveals the inflammatory cells according to the Marburg criteria. Inflammatory cells at least 14, predominantly T lymphocyte, with no more than four cells macrophage. Okay, so uh, this will take us uh, again uh, in the part of the diagnosis. If it is pathological and endomyocardial biopsy is not readily available, and even when it is available, it's not that uh, sensitive high percentage of uh, false negatives. So uh, what do you think of MRI in patients with MINOCA? The uh, last I did was for a patient who had a stent in the left main. Uh, he came one year after the stent with cardiac arrest and left bundle branch block. His coronary angiogram showed patent stents, no significant lesions. We, we think it's a minoca. So is MRI to rule out myocarditis an integral part of the workup of minoca? Of course, of course. My cardiac MRI is an integral part of diagnosis of myocarditis because it gives us insights about all the, path, all the pathogenesis of myocarditis. It can detect edema. It can detect vascular dilatation and hyperemia in the early stage. It can detect expansion of the, of the extra, extracellular space either due to degeneration or necrosis, which happens in the early stages, or later on by replacement of fibrosis, which also expands the extracellular space. However, the concern about the cardiac MRI is the, is the time when you do the MRI. If you did the MRI early in the stage of myocarditis, you will show the edema. If you did it more than 14 days after myocarditis, you will lose this privilege. Okay, so um, echo. Uh, we know that there are different patterns. In some patients, we see significant hypertrophy because of the edema. Uh, so is there any specific uh, hypertrophy uh, concentric? Is it uh, eccentric? Is it asymmetric or symmetric? Um, no, no, in the echocardiogram, no specific feature for myocarditis. But as we said before, in cases of acute myocarditis, especially fulminant myocarditis, there is no time for the ventricle to, the, to dilate. If you see the end systolic diameter is the only dimension that is increased, coupled with increased ventricular wall thickness, you speak of something of an injury or acute injury to the myocardium. Sometimes the diagnosis of myocarditis is presumptive. That means after three months, if the patient is improved, it is usually a myocarditis. If not, it is idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, so we talked uh, uh, several slides about the immune uh, uh, mechanisms, which, which are very pertinent, and they are the center of the pathology. And you said some microRNA, and microRNA now is growing uh, in cardiology, and there will be uh, specific therapies for lipids and for other factors. So yeah. could you give us, go back to the basics and tell us what are the microRNAs, where do they come from? How are we utilizing them? Yes, microRNA are epigenetic. Epigenetic that it does, it does not, not according gene. It does not translate it into proteins or into something uh, like that, but it regulates the gene, just regulation. This regulation can go in both directions. It may be beneficial effect, like, as I said, like the microRNA 20, uh, 221 or 222 that inhibit the viral replication and subsequently inhibit inflammation. And some of them evokes inflammation. 
Therefore, this epigenetic, this regulation of the gene can be modulated by drugs, by oligonucleotide antisense that inhibit the injurious microRNA that increase the synthesis of the cytokines or in, it flares the inflammatory pathway. Is this clear? Uh, to me, yes. I think we, we will need to study this more. It's, it's rising uh, exponentially. Uh, yes. Whenever there's myocarditis, there are three questions on the treatment. Yes. Number, are we giving antiviral or no? And of course, yes. the making this crazy uh, are uh, immunoglobulins immunosuppressants as steroids uh, yes. plasma from uh, recovered individuals yes so we will i will discuss these issues extensively in the next few slides okay so let's go on okay Isenophilic myocarditis, the isenophil may associated with myocardial inflammation in three distinct forms. Either allergic isenophilic myocarditis due to hypersensitivity to a drug or foreign antigen, or as a part of systemic isenophilic syndrome, primary or secondary hyperisenophilia, or a condition similar to fulminant myocarditis associated with isenophil degranulation and release of toxic material. Peripartium cardiomyopathy, this is a cardiomyopathy toward the end of pregnancy and five months after delivery with no pre-existing cardiac dysfunction. It raises some, some questions about the etiology. It may be due to myocarditis because of finding a viral genome in a high percentage of patients, a um, high percentage of these subset of patients. Biopsy here is recommended only for patients with persistent left ventricular dysfunction not responding to the standard therapy. Uh, again, I remember uh, me, I remember myself and you by the very long list of acute of acquired myocarditis to have a question. 25 year old female present to her uh, primary care doctor with fatigue and rash, recently returned from New England vacation. Physical examination revealed well demarcated erythematous rash with, cent with central clearing, Lyme tetris positive, which is of the following statement is true. Cardiac manifestation typically occur within the days of development of rash. 10% develop cardiac manifestation. VT and supraventricular tachycardia are the most common. Heart failure is common. Which is the appropriate answer? So, Ahmed, uh, let us give uh, the YouTube uh, one minute to digest and answer this uh, nice question. Okay. And I hope we we'll go to New England for vacation together. <laughs> This used to be a famous question in the USMLE. Uh, yes, I, I, I can, this question, I copied it from Bronwald. Yes. Karim, can you tell me the answers goes percentage high to which one? Still, dear, there is no answers from uh, uh, the YouTube. The, no. They've got the question now. So uh, let, let's give them no one 15 wants seconds to... or any one, of the seconds. Board, any one of the board that can uh, answer this question if you want. Uh, I am glad that we are having uh, my brother and friend, Dr. Karim. To me, he's the encyclopedia of cardiology. Uh, okay always impresses me so if you would like to comment i would be glad dr karim was us So, uh, Ahmed, uh, the, on YouTube, uh, please go, please go, guys. On YouTube, we have uh, split answers between uh, two, 10% develop uh, cardiac manifestation, and four, heart failure is common. Then let so me... The YouTube answers are split, uh, splitted. Okay. Let me discuss the answer. I will go from below. 
Heart failure is common. No, heart failure is not common with Lyme carditis, especially in this era where antibiotics are given for this part of the, for this disease. Ventricular tachycardia, supraventricular, are not the most common cardiac manifestation, usually presented by atrioventricular block and is usually transient. 10% develop cardiac manifestation. Uh, this is uh, true, since a very small number develop the cardiac manifestation. Cardiac manifestation typically occur within days of development of rest. This is the wrong answer. Because the patient develops this part, this type of rash, uh, not within day, within weeks of the rash. Okay, uh, who, who I uh, Lyme disease? Hmm. Anyone? Huh? I listen to you, Dr. Hussein. Has anyone seen it in his practice? You know, oh. I have never seen Lyme carditis in my practice. Or even the disease, like even Lyme disease. No, I didn't see Lyme disease in my practice. My whole practice. Uh, then we will go to the second question. 45 year old male presenting to the ER with fatigue and dyspnea palpitation in the last three days. The patient admitted to the CCU and ECG monitoring revealed bouts of non sustained VT. His lab revealed elevated cardiac troponin I and elevated serum calcium. His echo revealed regional wall motion abnormality and depressed ejection fraction 40%. Can I ask my colleague what the, my colleagues what is the next step? Coronary angio, electrophysiology, medical treatment, multi-slice CT coronary angiography. Uh, if I'm allowed to comment, of course. I think uh, one of the key uh, points here is elevation of the serum calcium. Yes, <laughs> this is true. This is a key. <laughs> but here, this is patient that develop heart failure symptoms of acute onset with ventricular arrhythmia and elevated cardiac troponin, regional wall motion abnormality in the echo. For me, for me, I'll go to coronary angiography. What is your uh, opinion, Dr. Hussein? Elevated uh, serum calcium here raises uh, uh, some questions. Yes, this is in the next sequence. <laughs> but at this step, I may go for coronary angiography. Okay, coronary angiography is, is usually the easiest thing that we can do. Yes. In this patient, coronary angiography revealed the mild atherosclerotic coronary artery disease. Revisiting his investigation, the X-ray showed bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy. What do you think is the next step? To me, I know the answer. Let's see for revising the issue. What do you think, Hayes? So, uh, just a few seconds the for, the, for the YouTube to vote, Ahmed. Okay. I think there is an uh, uh, Paul uh, Paul Shodi told uh, the diagnosis explicitly sarcoid. <laughs> of course, sarcoidosis is a multi-system disease. In the old literature, it, it affects about five percent of the patients, but recently it is up to twenty-five percent of patients with sarcoidosis have cardiac involvement. The most commonly involved organ is the lung, with reticular nodulation pattern as bilateral and symmetrical lymphadenopathy. In patients with in patient like this with sarcoidosis, the best investigation to do is to do either cardiac MRI or to do PET CT. After PET CT or cardiac MRI, if we found pictures suggestive of sarcoidosis, the next step to take a biopsy. And the biopsy, it is not recommended to take biopsy from the heart. It is better to take a biopsy from the lymph node. If not, you are forced to take a biopsy from the heart. If you took a biopsy from the heart, you will find non caseous granuloma. And you will see a multinucleated giant cell at the periphery with much fibrosis and less xeno. Now we will uh, go to the next. If we, if we stay here for a second, Ahmed. Okay. Uh, Sarcoid is known for the notorious tendency for particular arrhythmia. 
Yes, yes, it can cause ventricular arrhythmia because it's a granuloma. It is inflammation, and the inflammation healed by fibrosis. And the fibrosis is the nidus for re-entry. Therefore, these patients are famous by ventricular tachycardia. Also, if the granuloma involves the conductive system and healed by fibrosis, it will destroy the conductive system. Therefore, sarcoidosis, uh, uh, we can see the fibrosis of the ventricle, aneurysm formation, affection of the conductive system, all of these, the picture of sarcoidosis. And in sarcoidosis in particular, the threshold for inserting a CD, an ICD, is lower than other patients because of the uh, healing by fibrosis and the predominant inflammation it, uh, uh, it causes in the heart. It was going to be my question because intuitively you think that it's an inflammatory process let's suppress it by any immunosuppressant and probably the ventricular arrhythmia would go but because healing would be an either for re-entry and arrhythmia so as you said 100 percent right the threshold for inserting a defibrillator should be very low thank you of course we will go to treatment Immune suppressive drugs. Immune suppressive drug is not a routine treatment for patients with myocarditis. And I will see why. In US myocardial, myocarditis treatment the trial, which I have mentioned just a few seconds, few minutes before, it uh, divides the patient into two groups. One group that receives the steroid plus either thiobrine or cyclosporin versus group that took placebo. There is, was no change regarding the ejection fraction or the transplant free survival rate compared with placebo. Immune suppressive drug is reserved for specific exceptions. Include giant cell myocarditis, include cardiac sarcoidosis, eosinophilic myocarditis, or myocarditis associated with inflammatory connective tissue disorder. However, in a relatively recent trial, which is the tailored immune suppression in inflammatory cardiomyopathy, despite it is 18 five patients, they tested which are, will be the responder to the immune suppressive drug. And they found that the virus negative patient uh, showed increase in the ejection fraction from 26 to 46, which is a great improvement. And the quality of life have been improved in this trial. However, ongoing or further trials are needed to confirm this data. A short course of immune suppression in chronic dilated cardiomyopathy failed to respond to guideline based therapy may be tried. But the bottom line immune suppressive drugs means a specific indication, giant cell myocarditis, sarcoidosis, or eosinophilic myocarditis. Treatment of viral infection, the question of Dr. Hussein before. It may be, help, may be helpful in the management of post transplantation viral heart disease in children. A very small trial that is done in patients with chronic dilated cardiomyopathy with viral genome detected by PCR, they give them interferon beta three times per week, and it improves the condition and the outcome was good. However, it is a very small study and need to be repeated. Ventricular arrhythmia or heart to block due to acute myocarditis. If you face the ventricular arrhythmia or heart to block in this setting, you should hospitalize the patient for electrocardiographic monitoring. Usually, the arrhythmia resolves within a few weeks. It may extend to a few months till the edema subsides and the inflammation comes down or calm down. In acute arrhythmia emergency, if you found VT, you will give DC, the same as for convention. And the indication for ICD is the same. Apart from the threshold for intervention is high in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis or giant cell myocarditis. A patient with suspected lymphocytic myocarditis and non-sustained VT, in the period you are not sure it's the inflammation subsided or not, a vest may be tried. Mechanical circulatory support is very important as a bridge to recovery or transplantation in patients with to bridge to recovery in patients with permanent myocarditis usually recover, bridge to transplantation or recovery in patients with giant cell myocarditis. The time for recovery varies and may end up to a few months. Transplantation effective is an effective therapy for patients with myocarditis. You have nothing to do with medical treatment or mechanical circulatory support. And it is, um, fortunately, the survival rate is the same for patient myocarditis or patient without myocarditis etiology. Here is a summary of the treatment. If you find a patient with myocarditis, if the hemodynamics are unstable, you should put him on onotropic agent 
you may use the assist device if the patient becomes stable back to the standard therapy is inhibitor beta blocker aldosterone antagonist. If not, may consider cardiac transplantation. If the patient is stabilized on diuretic and vasodilators, you can go to the remodeling therapy is inhibitor beta blocker and consider indication for ICD. Well, the exercise. If a patient has myocarditis, what would you uh, prescribe for him regarding exercise? There is a theory from animal models that myocarditis increases cell death, increases necrosis, and they may lead to sudden cardiac death. Therefore, arbitrarily, you should avoid exercise, vigorous exercise for up to six months. Length of restriction guided by the clinical recovery and lift of ventricular function. Follow up of patients with myocarditis, uh, no guideline but initially one to three months for drug and physical activity titration. Serial echocardiographic assessment often needed, but the frequency not known. What about the prognosis? In patient, we will divide the prognosis in the acute setting and in the chronic setting. In the acute setting, the risk of this and need for cardiac transplantation is higher if the damage is high. The damage is high is known by the echo, uh, patient with lower ejection fraction, patient with impaired right ventricular function, or patient with high pulmonary artery pressure. The presence of uh, active myocarditis with numerous inflammatory cells in, uh, infiltrating the myocyte, uh, the myocardium predicts the risk of this or need for transplantation. In patient with chronic dilated cardiomyopathy, if we found inflammatory cell or endomyocardial biopsy, this is, uh, this, is, this is good, not bad, because this subset of patient may improve with the short course of immune suppression. In a patient with recent onset dilated cardiomyopathy who are bridged to recovery, we found the inflammation was present by fibrosis is not evident. This means if you find inflammatory cells abundant in the myocardium, it may be a hope if the patient is supported well during this period and the inflammation subsides. If the fibrosis is much more, the recovery will be delayed. Cardiovascular uh, MRI is have a good role in the prognosis. If you find delayed gadolinium enhancement and scar in a large amount of the myocardium, the arrhythmic events will be high. Impact of viral genome and the outcome has been questioned in the application. Not the mere presence of the viral genomes. It's about the function of the virus, mainly copy number and uh, replicative intermediate. The picture is not bad. Many patients will have full spontaneous recovery. In myocarditis treatment trials, the four-year mortality or 50%, same as heart failure. In hospital case series, 12-year survival rate, 90% for fulminant myocarditis versus 45 for non-fulminant etiology. This means the fulminant myocarditis is a very good prognosis. As I said before, you should support this patient even with mechanical circulatory support, even for a few months because this patient will recover because the main issue is too much inflammatory cell and less amount of fibros. Progression to dilated cardiomyopathy, then, as we said in the immune response, the immune response, if it lingers, leading to chronic inflammation, cytokines and interferon, leading to apoptosis of the myocyte, hypertrophy of the myocyte, leading to development of cardiomyopathy over a period that may extend up to 13 years. Vice versa, if we found the patient's idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, the histologic evidence is only 4 to 10%. The risk of severe heart failure requiring this maker is very, very low, about 1%. Thank you all. Dr. Hussein. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank One, you, Dr. Hussein. Uh, and we still have uh, questions coming from the viewers on YouTube. OK. Now we're going to uh, treatment. So. Uh, treatment has three parts. The standard guideline directed therapy for heart failure, especially acute heart failure. Yes. Everyone. And then the uh, specialized therapies. Now we're talking about who should take the antiviral, who should take uh, the steroids, uh, who should take the recovering plasma, if that's an option. Yes. And before we go to these specific therapies, do, do we have specific data on using uh, RAS blockers or beta blockers in acute myocarditis? Uh, yes. Um, in the acute setting, the standard therapy is the first-line therapy. 
first line to start with diuretics and vasodilator. Then if your patient is stabilized or intravenous diuretics and the vasodilator, we will go to the second step, which anti-remodeling therapy is inhibitor, as you said, and beta blocker. However, they should be used in the manner as, uh, as it is prescribed. Beta blocker, should you go slow and dihydrate very slow, the ACE inhibitor according to the kidney function and the blood pressure. This is a later stage. Acutely, it is diuretics and vasodilator. If the response, go to the next step. Uh, back, one step back, if the patient, you give the patient the, uh, the uh, diuretics and vasodilator and no response from the patient, we will go to the second step, which is uh, pressor, uh, intravenous inotropes, uh, intravenous pressors. If the patient is improved, then go to, again, if the patient improved, go to remodeling therapy. If the patient didn't improve in vasopressors, you will go to the second step, which is a mechanical circulatory assist device. This subset of patient that's not uh, not improved by the inotropes are, uh, and they are on mechanical support device, you should give for this patient a specific therapy here, immune suppressive drug, steroid, intravenous immunoglobulin, you should try in this patient, especially if you have a diagnosis of giant cell myocarditis or sarcoidosis. Sometimes when the patient subjected to mechanical assist device, you can take a frozen section. You can take a biopsy from the heart and frozen it, and you examine it. You may find giant cell myocarditis or cyclodosis, then you will be reassured that immunotherapy will help the problem. If not, if all of these uh, in vain, you will go for cardiac transplantation. Okay, um, another question about uh, peculiarities of the immune response. Now COVID also taught us that the cytokine storm is an essential a component in myocardial injury. So yeah. do you have an idea why uh, uh, the immune response is stronger at uh, young age and why uh, the prevalence, uh, I'm sorry, the incidence of myocarditis declines slightly, uh, significantly after the age of 40? Yes, this is because as we said before, the immune system, if the immune system exposed for this virus or this antigen for the first time, definitely the response will be vigorous and the release of cytokine is, is large. This is in contrary to the elderly. In the elderly, they may have repeated subclinical infection, exposed the virus many times before. Therefore, the immune system developed the tolerance against the virus. Therefore, the response will not be vigorous. It will be a, more as a chronic inflammatory response or what we call molecular mimicry as in rheumatic heart disease. It may identify the myocardial proteins like the myosin as the internal antigen and attack it leading to autoimmune reaction and the chronic reaction leading to dilated cardiomyopathy. Therefore, in elderly, it is usually acute myocarditis. In the elderly, it is usually, usually not always, it is a dilated cardiomyopathy. You know that this resembles what happened in the so-called Spanish flu, which was the pandemic of the previous century. The code that was a killer mainly of the young age, unlike this one, like the COVID-19, which is a killer of the elderly. And the reason behind why the Spanish old flu, the old influenza used to kill the young more is that they didn't have uh, immunity. Yes. And they so this could be the uh, now uh, Hagar is also asking uh, any peculiar features uh, on echo cardiac sarcoid to my knowledge there is it, it tends to involve the interventricular septum of course the mid and the apical part of the interventricular septum is the main or the most popular site for the granuloma of sarcoidosis Okay, uh, is there an algorithm, a clear algorithm for diagnosis of uh, myocarditis? Yes, of course, the, there is a clear algorithm. You can, there is a clear algorithm for diagnosis of sarcoidosis, is split it into two parts. If you speak about uh, extra cardiac sarcoidosis or cardiac sarcoidosis, if the patient you ha have a diagnosis of extra cardiac by hilar lymphadenopathy and you took a biopsy from the lymph node and you found the sarcoidosis then to diagnose if the patient had sarcoidosis, uh, myocardial sarcoidosis is not, it is based on tr some criteria, like the presence of ventricular tachycardia, the presence of high-grade AV block, 
the present of left ventricular dysfunction, young age, less than 50, then 50 years old patient with left ventricular ejection fraction is low. If you found this criteria, then you will go to the diagnostic test, cardiac MRI or PET scan. This is for extra cardiac. For cardiac sarcoidosis, you will, uh, you, 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 um, you will find the patient with cardiac symptoms, with heart failure symptom, with ventricular arrhythmia. And this patient like the question, you will try to diagnose extra cardiac sar sarcoidosis to do CT. If you found the hilar lymphadenopathy, it is solved. You will take a biopsy from the lymph node. If it is positive, it is finished. If not, you will go to cardiac MRI or PET. And uh, if no extra cardiac site to take a biopsy, take uh, endomyocardial biopsy guided by MRI. So uh, the issue of immunosuppression is, is uh, hot in the mind. So yeah. I would uh, phrase the question. In myocarditis, that's not responding to the heart failure regular therapy, but you didn't do an endomyocardial biopsy. Yeah. And the serology of the viruses that we know, and it's negative. Yes. Can you still go for steroids or not? Yeah. You can, I, I will offer a steroid. So it depends on the disease severity, not on the presence of the viral particles uh, by PCR or by the inflammatory reaction by endomyocardial biopsy. As, as per the trial I have showed before, if you had uh, endomyocardial biopsy, it is good. And if the patient is viral negative, you will know that the, this patient will most probably a responder. If it is negative, it is not responder. If the endomyocardial biopsy is not available, go for a steroid diet. So I would uh, try to recap uh, what Dr. Ahmed said and what we said in the discussion. Uh, Myocarditis is now uh, a very active. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, the definition, which is mostly a pathological definition. Uh, the role of the immune system, cytokine storms, uh, microRNA uh, imaging, how MRI is of extreme importance. It can give you pathological insights to what's happening in the myocardium. Uh, we talked about the echo patterns, the ventricular hypertrophy in fulminant myocarditis. Uh, we talked about the different uh, etiologies, the peculiarities. Of specific forms, particularly uh, sarcoid, uh, Lyme disease, uh, uh, viral uh, types. And uh, we gave a hint on the treatment, which is mostly uh, guideline directed therapy for heart failure and specific therapies uh, like antiviral uh, immunosuppressants and uh, mechanical circulatory support. Uh, to me, this was one of the most uh, lovely Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Hassin. Uh, for wrapping up this uh, great session uh, by my dear friend, uh, Dr. Ahmed Shahayta. Uh, Ahmed gave us a very comprehensive uh, resume of uh, a very difficult topic, actually, which usually we don't like to study because it has lots of pathophysiological cascades, uh, immune markers, and so on. And we don't like this kind of pathophysiology as cardiologists, we want to hit and run. So actually, it's the best to be tackled by uh, two great scientists for me, uh, Dr. Ahmed Shahata, and of course, Professor Hussein Hishma added a lot uh, to the scientific value of this discussion. Uh, thank you so much to all of our audience from all over the world who joined us on the YouTube channel. Next uh, Saturday, we will have uh, the congenital heart disease course. We will be discussing uh, the left-sided obstructive congenital heart disease lesions. It will be a very interesting uh, topic. Dr. Zahran. Uh, and I, I can tell you, yes. Can we have a, a one more question from the YouTube audience? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, there a is very... a question. Uh, 
Okay, go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. It's a question about the use of inotropes uh, in cardiogenic shock, uh, complicating myocarditis. Is uh, these uh, inotropes will be proarrhythmic and worsen the condition or uh, the liability of developing VT and SVT for those patients? Or, um, it, it, and the, if there is any specific inotrope uh, that is, um, uh, that is prevailed uh, or um, you can choose in these patients or any inotrope um, will, will do the same? Yes, let me answer this question. Inotropic agents are used. Uh, inotropic, inotropic agent for treatment of acute myocarditis is used because the patient is shocked. You have nothing to do to elevate his blood pressure and improve his perfusion. It is one of the disadvantages of the inotropic agent to be proarrhythmic. However, you need this. I will tell you something. In patients with chronic, with chronic heart failure following the myocarditis, you will refrain from lanoxin because there is concern about it increase the mortality and increase the sudden cardiac death, as you said, pro-arrhythmic effect. However, in the acute setting, the situation is difficult. You are dealing with a dying patient. You should give him inotropic agent. If the arrhythmia is increased, you can add any uh, anti-arrhythmic drugs or, uh, or correct electrolytes or correct the clinical setting of the patient, but you have nothing to do. Or mechanical circulatory assisted device and reduce the dose of inotropes. It is an essential part of the treatment. If you use it and you sound and sound complication, you will shift it to another thing, which is to mechanical circulatory assisted device. But from the start, you should know, you should use it. Okay, and, and there so is much, no particular uh, no particular and there is no particular in hope. No, the standard dopamine, dobutamine, and no red. Thank you so much. Thank you, Haysam. Thank you so much, uh, Ahmed, and thank you so much, Haysam, uh, for moderating uh, from the YouTube. Next Saturday, the congenital heart disease course will include a very interesting uh, webinar about uh, left-sided obstructive lesions. Next Tuesday, we will have a very interesting uh, topic from the bifurcation uh, campus. Uh, Dr. Haysam Suleiman uh, and Dr. Ahmed Mohanad will be discussing with us the rationale, decision-making, and how to optimize the provisional uh, stenting technique uh, uh, compared to the two stent strategy. And next Thursday, we'll be completing the hypertension part two with uh, Professor Hatim Sukari. Also, he will enlighten us with a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, I'm glad and honored to have you all on board. I would like to thank uh, Professor Hussein Hishmat, Professor Karim Saeed, uh, Dr. Ahmed Shahada, and all the CDC board and all our audience and moderators. Thank you so 